Hello, my name is Amani Wazwaz, and I'm a professor of communications and literature at Moraine Valley Community College. I am doing this video for the Moraine Reads program. Moraine Reads is dedicated to promoting reading and the love of books. And for my Moraine Reads pick, I have chosen to discuss The Street by Anne Petrie. In this video, I will be briefly summarizing this book as well as explain why I recommend it, read six passages, and connect this book with other prominent African American texts. What is this book about? This book centers on the challenges faced by a young African American mother by the name of Ludie Johnson. Ludie's main goal in life is to take care of her young son, Bub. Ludie and Bub live in a street in a neighborhood where many struggling African Americans live. This neighborhood has been devalued and not well cared for. So Ludie's job, she sees her mission as the quest to protect Bub by any means necessary and to take him out of the hopelessness and the lack of opportunities present on the street in this neighborhood. This is a brief summary. Why do I recommend this very powerful novel? For one, at the heart of it, Ludy Johnson is such a genuine character with a deep, sincere love for her son. When you read this novel, should you decide to read it, you will notice as the main character struggles to find a job so that she can care for her son, you cannot help but root for her. You want her to succeed. You want the very best for her. There's also something else that's very powerful about Anne Petrie's writing. Anne Petrie inspires us to ask, all right, so Ludie Johnson, with her strength, with her determination, with her great care for her son, are these very powerful traits enough to allow her to succeed? Anne Petrie seems to inspire us to consider, shouldn't society also be helping individuals? Shouldn't society also be helping African American individuals be given more opportunities, opportunities, and to secure jobs? Another powerful reason that the street is such a great novel is that it allows us to take a look at the factors that unfortunately dissolved Ludie Johnson's marriage to her former husband, Jim. So I would like to share with you two passages. One of them in my version of uh, the book is on page 168. And what makes this such a great novel is that Petri does not turn this into a love story. This is a woman who is very much committed to taking care of her son. But every now and then she allows us to pause and think, why is Jim no longer in Ludie's life? So I would like to share with you, it's on page 168, what Anne Petrie had to say. She said the following, Jim's face had been open, honest, young. Come to think of it, when she and Jim got married, it looked as though it should have been a happy, successful marriage. They were young enough and enough in love 
to have a ma to have made a go of it. It always came back to the same thing. Okay, so they were young, they were in love. It seemed like their marriage could have been successful, but then Petri said it always came back to the same thing. And that same thing, Petri insists, is Jim couldn't find a job. So day by day, month by month, big, broad-shouldered Jim Johnson went to pieces because there wasn't any work for him and he couldn't earn anything at all. He got used to facing the fact that he couldn't support his wife and child. It ate into him. Slowly, bit by bit, it undermined his belief in himself until he could no longer bear it. Petri stresses that Jim is a strong person, big, broad-shouldered Jim Johnson. She also stresses he wanted to care for Ludi. He wanted to care for his son, but he was never given this opportunity. She says it. It always went back to the very same reason. It ate into him. Something in him broke because he could not care for his wife nor his son. Along these same lines, I would like to share yet another passage, and it's on page 388. Anne Petrie, what is also so powerful about her writing is this. She does, she focuses on Ludi and her problems and Jim's problems as well too. But then you will notice if you read the book, she also steps back and she does a critique. She lets her main character think about different situations, different societal forces at play in keeping African Americans down. So on page 388, she says the following. Why do the women work? It's such a simple, reasonable reason. And just thinking about it will make your legs stop trembling like the legs of a winded, blown, spent horse. The women work because the white folks give them jobs, washing dishes, and clothes, and floors, and windows. The women work because for years now, the white folks haven't liked to give black men jobs that paid enough for them to support their families. Anne Petrie steps back and lets Ludi think about her situation. So in this world, this world of the 1940s, the book was published in 1946, Ludi Johnson is thinking, why are all of these separated and divided families? And mind you, she's not referring to every household, just particular ones. So what she's talking about is that there are certain white families and institutions that would much prefer to give African American women jobs this leaves African-American men without jobs, and what it leads to is a broken home, separated families. This takes me into my next um, point, which is that Ludi is such a powerful character. When she saw that her husband was not being given the opportunity, what did she do? She up and went and she worked as a help for this white family and when she was with them she would hear them insulting her discriminating against her and she stayed with them and this was this white family was in another city so when Ludi came back she came back to her home and she found 
that Jim had already moved on with another woman. So this broke down her marriage. And that is a tragedy. But like I insist, Anne Petri shows this is not a love story. This is the story of a woman who wants to care for her son. So Ludy Johnson up and takes Bub and they go to live on this street. And I already mentioned earlier, the street has been devalued. It, it has not been well cared for at all. And yet again, I want to share with you Anne Petrie's genius. Please take a look at the way that she describes the street. The street itself is like a character. And if you decide to read this novel, and I hope that you do, there is so much to unpack about the street. It's like a character within itself. So please take a look at the way that she describes it. And I will be looking at page 323, 323, and Ludi is made to say the following. Streets like the one she lived on were no accident. They were the North's lynch mobs, she thought bitterly the method the big cities used to keep Negroes in their place. And she began thinking of Pop unable to get a job, of Jim slowly disintegrating because he too couldn't get a job, and of the subsequent wreck of their marriage, of Bub left to his own devices after school. From the time she was born, she had been hemmed into an ever-narrowing space. Until now, she was very nearly walled in, and the wall had been built up brick by brick by eager white hands. This passage is very significant because what Anne Petrie is stressing is the following. You have Ludie Johnson's father, Pop, who was denied the chance of being given a job. And then it went to the next generation. And I'm guessing Jim must be in his 20s. So you have the younger generation the husband also did not get a chance to have a job. And then the little boy, Bub. And Bub is left to be cared for by Ludi. And Ludi is so terrified for him. And the tragedy is the grandfather, the father, the son. So the grandfather and the father were not given opportunities and we hope as readers alongside Ludi that Bub will be given the chance. Also amazing about this novel is that Petri allows us into the mind of Ludi as she worries so much about her son because she goes out working and she's so worried about him. And then we also see the perspective from Bub's side because Bub stays at home at night and the passages that Petri creates in this novel are just so remarkable. You cannot help but feel so sorry for this little boy who is so terrified of staying home by himself. He sits there and he starts imagining things. So if you read it, you'll see what I mean. Also really great about M. Petri is she allows us into the minds of different people on the street. And mind you, you will notice if you read this book, some of these characters, they're not all angels. Some of them are villains. Some of them have a very terrifying and sinister way of thinking. You'll start wondering to yourself, who thinks this way? 
it, that also adds an element of interest to this book, but I'll leave that for you to discover. For me, I want to focus on the human aspects of this novel, and one of the human aspects that I want to concentrate on has to do with the murder of a young African-American man on the street. So one day, Ludi was walking down the street and she noticed there was a circle of people. They were gathered all together. And when she walked, she looked. There was this man who was lying on the street. There was blood and he had been killed unfortunately and very tragically and so what does Ludi think about as she's looking at him of all the things that she could have thought of she paid close attention to his shoes and I would like to share that with you so the part where she reads about his uh, where she concentrates on his shoes is on page 196 in my edition. But the thing she had never been able to forget were his shoes. Only the uppers were intact. They had once been black, but they were now a dark, dull gray from long wear. The soles were worn out. They were mere flaps attached to the uppers. She could see the layers of wear. The first outer layer of leather was left near the edges, and then the great gapping holes in the center where the leather had worn out entirely, so that for weeks he must have walked practically barefooted she had stared at the shoes, trying to figure out what it must have been like to walk barefooted on the city's concrete sidewalks. She wondered if he had ever went downtown, and if he did, what did he think about when he passed store windows filled with sleek furs and fabulous food and clothing made of materials so fine you could tell by looking at them they would feel like sea foam under your hand. Ludie Johnson pays so much attention to his shoes. To highlight, shoes are supposed to help a human being get from one place to another. Shoes are supposed to give comfort and allow a person to keep moving ahead. This African-American man was not given the chance to walk and walk freely, and instead he walked with so much uneasiness before his life was so brutally taken away from him. Ludi also notices this. She tries to highlight, and Petri tries to highlight, the big differences between those who have the people in downtown those who have the sleek furs, the wonderful food. And he must have seen it, and he must have known and compared his situation with theirs. This is a big tragedy, that he was not given the opportunity to go places, that his life was cut short, that the shoes that should have been there to help him walk the sidewalk and walk through the streets of life they were worn out. They were tattered. This is a tragedy. And also another tragedy is, besides his life being brut brutally taken away, is his sister and what happens to his sister. On the very next page, I would like to share with you on page 197, Ludi paid attention to the shoes that were in pieces she also pays attention to the sister. So on page 197, Ludi says the following. Ludi didn't look at the man's face. Instead, she looked at the girl, so the sister of the man who was killed. 
and she saw something, some emotion that she couldn't name, flicker in the girl's face. It was as though for a fraction of a second, something, hate or sorrow or surprise, had moved inside her and been reflected on her face. As quickly as it came, it was gone, and it was replaced by a look of resignation, of complete acceptance. It was an expression that said the girl hoped for no more than from the girl hoped for no more than this from life because other things that had happened to her had paved the way so that she had lost the ability to protest against anything, even death, the death of her brother, even death suddenly like this in the spring. I always thought it had happened, she said in a flat voice. Why doesn't she scream? Ludi had thought angrily. Why does she stand there looking like that? This is one among the many, many powerful passages in the novel. So the young girl, she doesn't scream. For a moment, there's just a little bit of anger on her face. And Anne Petrie is inspiring us to think alongside with Ludi Johnson. No. There should be anger. There should be screaming in the face of injustice. There should not be an acceptance of this brutality. There should be a protest. Something should be done. There should be rage against all of this brutality. And it is so unfortunate that this young girl, something inside of her breaks. And Anne Petrie, I suggest, is trying to have us understand, pause, and really think about why is it that she's breaking? Why is it that she thinks, okay, you know, she had somewhat ex expected this to happen. No, it shouldn't be this way. This acceptance, this lack of rage. There's also something going on with the idea of rage and should you decide to read this please consider the emotions being displayed in this novel and the emotions of african-american rage in response to injustices and suffering there's a lot going on i want to focus from continue focusing on ludy johnson ludy johnson had just paid attention to this girl whose brother was murdered and this girl there's something broken inside of her well Ludi also suffers as well too and one very powerful passage I would like to share with you is on page 390 and this one is so incredibly powerful you see Ludi was coming back home and she started crying and the people in her apartment building heard her well the materials the walls you know in that apartment building they're not made of good material to begin with so they heard her and everybody in the apartment building they rushed to make sure that they would not hear her and you see it's like in her tears and in her weeping, they saw themselves reflected. It's like you see somebody else's pain, and then it reminds you of yourself, and their pain is so overwhelming because your pain is so overwhelming, and you cannot handle it. So you attempt to create some kind of emotional barrier. And this is what's happening on page 390, and I would like to share this with you page 390 so they turned the residents they turned their faces away from the sight of her walked faster to get away from the sound of her 
They hurried to close the doors of their apartments, but her crying came through the flimsy walls, followed them through the tight shut doors. All through the house, radios went on full blast in order to drown out this familiar, frightening, unbearable sound. But even under the radios, they could hear it for they started crying with her when the sound first assailed their ears. And now it had become a perpetual weeping that flowed through them, carrying the pain and a shrinking from pain so that the music and the voices coming from the radios couldn't possibly shut it out, for it was inside of them the pain was already inside of them. Ludy Johnson's pain and suffering at the injustices of the world around her, it's already inside of them. They're all mirroring one another. Her pain, her sorrow, her quest to find a decent livelihood, a decent job. This is their quest as well too. Her big wish to take good care of her son it's also rippled in this community as well, too. Again, the genius of Anne Petrie. Ludy Johnson's story is not just her story alone. She focuses so much on this one individual, humanizes her tremendously, allows us as readers to understand her and to understand her pain and her great wish for her son, for the younger generation. And then, when we are so absorbed, she also does not allow us to forget that Ludy Johnson's story is also echoed throughout the African-American community living on the street in this particular neighborhood. Now, what will happen to Ludy Johnson? Will she be able to find that job that will help her to gather enough money so that she could leave the street and the neighborhood? Will she be able to protect Bub the way that she wants? I will leave that for you to find out should you decide to read this book. It is great and it's very readable and it's such an interesting read now i have been mentioning that Anne petrie's book concentrates on the personal in order to highlight the overall injustices and the other voices in the african-american community i would like to also address different voices in the african-american community as well too while I was reading this book, I want to also share with you that it reminded me of Harriet Wilson's Our Nig. And Harriet Wilson wrote this African American classic in the 19th century. And Harriet Wilson's seven year old son, which means he's pretty much very close to Bub's age. He was sick, unfortunately. So in order to make money, what Harriet Wilson did was she wrote this book. So she wanted to sell this book and make money so she could take her son to the doctor so he could be well cared for. This is not the subject of the book, but this is the history behind what drove her to write this book. I bring it up because these are two African-American women with a great, big, deep love for their children. I want to share more. I also would like to share with you Frederick Douglass. In his narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass, Frederick Douglass speaks with fondness about his mother, but he also talks about how he did not get the chance to be with her 
because when she passed away, I mean, she used to sneak in as a slave. She used to sneak every now and then so she could speak with him and be with him. And unfortunately, when she passed away, Douglas reports that he did not feel much because he had not been given the opportunity to cultivate a relationship with his mother. And this is very unfortunate. I also want to tell you that in both, in my bondage and my freedom, my bondage and my freedom, as well as his third autobiography, The Life and Times of Frederick Douglass, Frederick Douglass has the chance to speak more about his great fondness for his grandmother. So these two are wonderful. And I want to continue with the mother-son themes in the African-American community. Langston Hughes has this wonderful, wonderful short story called Thank You, Ma'am. And Thank You, Ma'am deals with uh, this woman who was one day walking down the streets and this boy attempted to snatch her purse and she brought him home with her. She taught him a lesson, took care of him. And even though the story is just four pages, it is so amazing. There's The main character is just so lovely and so loving. And she acts as such a great mother figure to the little boy who attempted to snatch her purse. I want to share more. Moving away just a bit from mother-son uh, themes, I want to talk about um, Paula Giddings in When and Where I Enter. She talks about how, you know, in, in the beginning, somewhere over here, she talks about how African-American men were denied jobs, but African-American women were given the chance to work in white family homes where they cooked, where they were the help. So this provides an amazing historical background. And along the same lines, the same themes as African-American women working, Zora Neale Hurston has this very powerful short story called Sweat. And in Sweat, the main character works as a washerwoman and her husband he does not work and their relationship is actually extremely abusive because the husband is very abusive but no matter what the main character Delia is so incredible because she wants to hold on to her home that sense of home is something that I find connects her and Ludie Johnson so much Ludie wants a, a good home for her son and Delia wants to hold on to a sense of home so dearly. These are some of my recommendations and I sincerely hope you give the street a chance if you made it this far. Thank you so much. Please check out the other Moraine Reads videos done by faculty, administrator, staff, and great students from Moraine Valley Community College. For those of you in the Moraine Valley community, please consider submitting your own Moraine Reads video. You can talk about classics. You can talk about little known books. You know, if you read in Polish, Arabic, French, Spanish, please consider sharing those as well too. You know, if you love graphic novels, if you love manga, please also consider talking about this. We welcome all kinds of readings. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you.